we have been blessed. We have been blessed so much that uh, when we have difficulties, we usually say that we have had a bad hair day. And that kind of lets people know that things aren't going the way we want. That, you know, and we do those types of things. Um, every once in a while in our lives, a really difficult circumstance happens. And if you've not experienced this really difficult circumstance, be patient, you will. Because that's the lot of humanity, is that we all experience sickness, death, disease, war, famine, earthquakes, fire, all sorts of difficult situations. But what is important is not the circumstance, but our response to that circumstance. And we're going to see in this portion of the book of Job, how Job responded to a series of devastating tragedies. He didn't have just a bad hair day. He didn't have just one bad circumstance. We're going to see in one day a series of tragedies, a series of devastations, which came about because God and Satan had a conversation about Job. And Satan accused Job of only worshiping God and praising God because he was blessed. And Satan said, if, if you take his stuff away, he will not only curse you, but curse you to his face, to your face. And God said, you can't touch him, but do with him as you will. And so in chapter 1, verse 13, it follows up after Satan has left the presence of the Lord to do what Satan does. Now on the day when his sons and his daughters, and that being him being Job, when his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. Now this reminds us that there was this series of events that the, that the seven brothers and the three daughters would take turns going through the celebrations each in one brother's house and then inviting their sisters to join in. So at this particular series, they're at this oldest brother's house. So they're celebrating at his house. And a messenger came to Job and said, the oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them. And the Sabians attacked and took them. They also slew the servants with the edge of the sword. And I am alone have escaped to tell you. And so, in essence, to put it in our modern vernacular, one of Job's businesses just got a hostile takeover. They seized his support. They, he seized the business, his income. And these people took them, and not only did they take his animals, which was a part of his business, they slew the servants as well. So they, they killed people that Job knew, that people that worked for Job, that Job had a knowledge of and trusted because they were participating in this part of his business. And while he was still speaking, another also came and said, the fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. So not only has one business been taken by a hostile another by supernatural causes a fire coming down from heaven has consumed a second part of his business he's now all of this part of his um able to to make sure that he is diversified now two of his life incomes has been taken away and again his servants have been killed. And while he was still speaking, another also said, came and said, the Chaldeans formed three bands and made a raid on the camels and took them and slew the servants with the edge of the sword. And I am alone 
have escaped to tell you. His final business venture has been attacked, hostile takeover, and removed. This has all happened in one day. As one servant tells him of a calamity, of a tragedy, before he's able to finish, another one comes in, and another one comes in. Now, most of us would be reeling under one circumstance. Job has now experienced three in succession immediately on the very same day. But that's not all of the tragedies. And while he was still speaking, another also came and said, your sons and your daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And behold, a great wind came from across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house and it fell on the young people and they died. And I alone have escaped to tell you. So now not only has Job's business has been decimated and removed, and he's now no longer a wealthy man. He no longer has his children. They've been killed. He's suffered attacks by others, and he's had, if you will, mother nature devastate him. All in the series of not only one day, but repeated and repeated and repeated before he can absorb the knowledge of one, another comes. Now, so often when people have difficulty, one of their immediate responses, why God? It's automatically, we blame God. And then it's like, well, did I sin? Did I do this? Why, why God are you doing this to me? And that's so often our response and many people's response to tragedies and difficulties. It's why. Job has a different response. Job doesn't seek to understand why at this point. Job doesn't seek to fall blame. He doesn't say, well, you know, if my servants would have been paying attention, they could have repelled the attacks of the Sabians and the Chaldeans and my Property would be safe. And if my house had been built, and my, brother, my son's house had been built better, or God hadn't caused the wind to happen, that my children would be here. That's not his response. His response is not why or to blame people or God. Notice what Job's response is. Then Job's, Job arose and tore his robe. That's in that culture, a sign of grief, that he tears his clothes. So he, he's not impervious to what has happened. It hurts him. It grieves him deeply. So he tears his robe and he shaves his head to let people know that he is grieving, that this is difficult. And he fell to the ground and worshipped. Of some of the most amazing statements in the scriptures, to me, this is one of the most amazing. He grieved. Didn't ask why. Didn't blame. He worshipped God. When some difficulty arises in our life, some tragedy, oh, that we would be like Job. When the doctor calls you into his or her office, and you know when he calls you or her calls you into his, his or her office, it's never for a good thing. And you can tell because you've been called in in the uncomfortable ability of this doctor and they tell you such things as you have cancer or you have leukemia or you have some illness, some 
multiple sclerosis, whatever the illness may be, it is a devastating statement. When you are told that you have cancer, all of a sudden, the rest of the conversation kind of stops. The doctor keeps talking, but you kind of stop listening because now you're trying to take in the impact. What does that mean to me? How much do I have to go through chemotherapy? Do I have some type of prognosis where I'm going to live longer? And the doctor's going to start saying, well, here's the courses of treatment and here are all the things. And, and it's just too difficult to take in because you've just been told you have this serious illness. Job weathered the multiple storms and then worshipped. Oh, that when we, and again, we will. If you've not already been told something devastating, that's not going to be the first or last time. You are going to get a series of events. You're told you have cancer and you're told to do things and you do those things. And then there may come a time when those treatments didn't work. All of a sudden you have to accept those things. It is Overwhelming, that's tragic. It's but the response of Job is, and the response that I hope the next time I have a tragic situation is that I worship God. It's not why, it's not how come, it's not God, are you mad at me? It's God, I worship you. Because you're my father who loves me and made me, sustained me even to this moment. So he worships and he says, naked I came from my mother's womb and naked I shall return. I didn't have anything when I came and I'm not taking anything with me when I leave. He says it more eloquently than I do. My lack of eloquence is there are no U-Haul trailers on the back of a hearse. He says, naked I came, naked I leave. They might dress me up, but I'm not even taking the funeral clothes with me. The Lord gave. Notice Job didn't say, man, I worked so hard to gain all that I had, all this wealth, all these businesses, all these servants, and children who were great. I worked so hard. And he goes, no, no, the Lord gave. The Lord blessed me. And the Lord has taken away. God is sovereign. What he allows to happen, happens. And what he does not allow to happen, does not happen. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He makes a statement of saying, it's not mine. The blessings were not because of me. It was because God gave them. And if God chooses as God to take them away, okay, but I'm going to bless his name regardless. And that should be our response. Whether God blesses us or God seems to take things away from us, we ought to say, blessed be the name of the Lord. And I want you to notice something. What did Satan say to God? If you do this, he will curse you to your face. And instead, Job goes, blessed be the name of the Lord. God knew Job. Satan just simply accused him. God knows you. But Satan will accuse you. 
And he will take the opportunity to accuse you and accuse you and accuse you and to take circumstances in this life that are difficult and try to get you to blame God, to try to get you to curse God. There are a lot of people who claim not to be believers, not because they don't believe in God, but because they're mad at God, because either God took something away or didn't give them something that they wanted. God wasn't Santa Claus, and so therefore, because he wasn't Santa Claus, they are mad at God. But our response is to worship him, to bless him. Through all of this, Job did not sin, nor did he blame God. It wasn't one tragedy. It was a series of tragedies in one day that most of us, if not all of us, would be seemingly overwhelmed. But all four happened almost simultaneously, and yet God was praised because Job knew who God was and blessed him and blessed his name and didn't blame God and didn't sin. There was a pastor who had lost his son in death. And like most of us would be reeling from that, and his um, pastor, mentor of his, gave him some advice that I think is some of the best advice I've ever heard a pastor give, which is saying something because most pastors give all kinds of advice. He said, do not exchange what you know about God with what you don't know about God. So let me tell you a few things about God in one particular passage in scriptures. If you'll turn to Romans chapter 8, one of my favorite books and one of my favorite chapters in the book. And we will start with verse 28. I'm sorry, 26. In the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groaning too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Sometimes things happen in our lives. We just don't know how to pray. We have no idea what to say or to do and ask. God says, I got you covered. The Spirit knows my will. The Spirit will intercede for you on behalf of you to pray according to my will. So when things happen and we're devastated, we don't have to find the words because the Spirit's going to pray for us, to intercede for us, to know what God's will is and to do it. And we know we don't suspect, we don't hope, we don't have a reasonable idea. We know that God causes all things to work together for good. Now, most people stop there because they want this to be universally applied. But we know that God causes all things to work together for good. He didn't say, one, that all things are good. I dare say that if you were to ask Job of any of these four series of, of things that were taken away from him, he would say none of them were good. He might say, okay, I can accept a couple of business losses, but why'd you have to mess with my kids? And other people who have terrible kids say, why, did, why don't you just take the kids and leave the businesses? So, you know, we all have our, our dysfunctions. He says... He didn't say all things are good. He says all things are cause to work together for good to those who love God. If you don't love God and stuff happens, 
Stuff happens. But if you love God and to those who are called according to his purpose, God is going to work to make it good. Now, how so many people in modern Christianity try to turn that in is that they will, some tragic event will happen. And they'll say, the good that God turned is, is that now I have this ministry where I can minister to people who have suffered the same thing that I suffered. I don't buy it. If God were to take one of my children or grandchildren, the fact that I have a new ministry would not be much of a good to me. I'd rather have my kids back. I'd rather have my grandkids back. I figure out another ministry. But we're always trying to, to fedangle and do things to, to, to make sense of it. God causes all things to work together for good. God's going to make it and do it right and do it for his purposes. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. God's going to take this terrible tragedies and make you like Jesus. Wait a minute. You're going to take terrible stuff and make me like Jesus. Well, guess what? God sent Jesus to suffer terrible stuff so that we might be like Jesus. So that he would be the firstborn among many brethren, and these whom he predestined, he also called, and these whom he called, he also justified, and these whom he justified, he also glorified. God has got a plan for our lives. We're seeking our purpose. The purpose is God has called us. God has predestined us. God has called us. God has justified us. And then God is going to glorify us. It's his purpose. Just be conformed to it. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all. How will he not also with him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather, who is raised, who is at the right hand of God, who will also intercedes for us. God has got your back and your front and your side and your bottom and your top. God has you. And Jesus intercedes for you. That's why he's sitting at the right hand of God. When we mess up, Jesus says, I paid for that. When we're faithless, Jesus says, I am faithful. Satan charged Job by saying, you take his blessings, he'll curse you to his face. And Jesus is there to say, no, he won't. Because I've interceded for him. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril? Just as it is written, for your sake, we are being put to death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. He's saying nothing can separate us from the love of God. So that advice that that pastor gave is scriptural. We know that God loves us. We know that God intercedes for us. We know that nothing can separate us, no matter how damaging those catastrophes and disasters might be. Nothing separates us from the love of God. So when those tragedies come and they will come, we don't question whether God loves me. Because he does. And he's going to make all things work together for good because I love God and I am called according to his purpose. 
Now, his purpose may be to say, hey, Satan, if you consider my servant, Joe, God, I'm not that, build a hedge around me first. But that's what God calls me to do, then that's what my mission is. And hopefully that I will remember the scriptures that says, nothing separates me from the love of God. Because he sent his son. But in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. We may be in the midst of our lives, and I love to use sporting analogies. We may be in the midst of a football game, and we look up at halftime, and the score is 99 to nothing, and we don't have the 99. And we may think that we're going to end in ignominious defeat. But according to God's word, when the game is over, we not only win, we win overwhelmingly. It's now a million to 99. Trust him. For I am convinced. I haven't thought about this. I haven't. Con I'm convinced. I've considered it and considered it and considered it and seen the observations and seen what God has done in my life and the lives of others. And I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor heights, nor depth, nor any other created thing, including Satan, will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. How is it that I know God loves me? Because of Jesus. How do I know that God hears me? Because of Jesus. How do I know that I'm a child of God because of Jesus. Because the God has expressed his love and who he is through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, like you, I hope the day when all of these Tragedies come is as far in the distance as possible because when it comes to those things, I am a definite procrastinator. I like the good life. Don't like so much the tribulation. But when that day comes, the word of God has told me nothing separates me from his love. So I don't have to say why God I don't have to say, are you mad at me, God? I don't have to blame God because he's unfair. Because I know nothing separates me from his love. Nothing. Not even myself. So as Job responded to all of these devastating tragedies, with worship and declaring, blessed be the name of the Lord. Not blaming God, but praising him. We should use as our example how to respond when those evil days come. To know when I don't understand, I will trust. When it hurts, I will trust. And I will make a statement that because of God's word, I know what it says. And therefore, I don't have to be afraid. Because he has me in this life and eternally. And all God's people said.